morning. Welcome to worship. We are so thankful that you are here. We continue on in our series, Building a Better St. Paul. Uh, today we focus on our fourth pillar, which is sharing our faith. Uh, our call from God uh, to share our faith with all those in the community. Uh, I pray that the Lord will bless us as we gather here for this time of worship. I just want to remind you uh, things that you probably don't need to be reminded of anymore. But if you happen to have uh, joined us for the first time today, I uh, want to encourage you that as we sing together that we do so with Mass on. If you're listening, well, just listen, and that's great. Uh, but if you are moved to sing, please uh, mask up. Also, communion uh, will be delivered to you, and offering is yours as you leave. You'll see that there are offering plates on either side of the door, and that is uh, a great time to give your offering. Uh, with that, uh, we are so grateful to God that we have our bell choir with us uh, this day, and we just enjoy.
that we have turned away from our faithful God. None of us is good. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let us therefore come before our Father in heaven in repentance and faith, seeking his pardon and restoration for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. With humble hearts, let us pray. Faithful Father, have mercy upon us. We have failed to obey your commands. O loving Savior, have mercy upon us. Wash us clean in your saving blood. Comforting Spirit, have mercy upon us. Restore us to be your own. Amen. Because of God's mercy and grace, salvation has come to us. We are forgiven in our Father's eyes, washed spotless by the washing of water with the Word. We are united with Christ, so rejoice and be glad. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mansion of your name. Jesus, your name is power, bread of the living water, such a marvelous mystery.
reads as follows. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel, which is found in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be Lord Christ. Please be seated. Good morning. I want to speak with uh, some of my younger friends now, talk to you a little bit about what we're going to talk about in the message today. And I, I want to start with a question. When you think of things that are beautiful, things that are beautiful, what, what comes to your mind? Yeah, Lily. Heaven is beautiful. I like that one. What other thought? Yes, go ahead. What's that? Paintings are beautiful. That's a good one. Yeah, Brielle. Sunflowers are beautiful. Oh, I like that. What else do we think about? Yes. God is beautiful. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Brielle. Rainbows are beautiful. I don't want to take anyone's answer, but was anyone going to say feet? <laughs> feet? Oh, I like that. Yeah, I like where you're going with that, right? You know, Lily, to your point, right? When the Apostle Paul writes to us in Romans... He says this, he says, How beautiful are the feet of those who go to bring the good news. Right? We don't always associate feet with beautiful. Right? We think feet and, what'd you say, Brielle? Stinky, right? You said feet and stinky, right? If I take my shoes off at home, some react like something really bad has happened. Right? Right? But see, Paul says to us, your feet are beautiful whenever you use them to go. To go and share the good news with other people. Why is that so important? How do we come to know who God is? Yeah, Lily. The Bible. Right? Uh, right? Paul says, how will they know if they do not hear? Right? If someone does not tell them. And so our feet are beautiful when our feet are the vehicle to bring us to other people with the good news. Today we're going to talk about what it means to share our faith. And I'll tell you what, this will scare the adults much more than it will you. Right? You know what it's like to share. You've been learning about sharing since you started school. And sharing our faith should not be something that frightens us. It should be just something that we do in everyday living. Because we love. Because we've been loved. And because we want to make sure everybody we meet can experience that love too. And so our feet are beautiful when we use them to do God's work. All right, my friends, will you pray with me, please? Let's take our hands and fold them, take our eyes and close them. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. 
this chance to worship. Help us to share our faith so that others may know you love them dearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. So if we're working together as one team, here to build a better St. Paul, if I've got a plan already, I should share it with you. And what I have for you is a no-fail plan to double the number of people who worship here every time we gather. It will work. It's guaranteed. How does it work? Each one of us brings one friend. That's it. We each bring one friend. And I would imagine you look like a popular group. You probably have more than one friend from which to pick. So why didn't we bring a friend with us this week if we didn't? Well, probably because we didn't bring a friend last week, and not much has changed in the last seven days. You see, we just fall into behavior patterns that don't typically change until we're confronted with a reason to change them. One of the most uh, convincing reasons to change is our own discomfort. And so often diets begin when our clothes start to feel too tight, right? Discomfort is a reason that we make a change. But it's not the best reason to change. The Apostle Paul tells us that the greatest reason to change what we do is to be motivated by love. He talks to us about this in 2 Corinthians. He says this, For Christ's love compels us, Right? Christ's love sends us, motivates us, moves us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live shall no longer live for themselves but for him who died and was raised again. The love of God is meant to compel what we do every given day we have. And we already discussed in the very first week together that we have this common understanding of what worship is. We come here to praise God and to receive God's gifts, everything that he has in store for us. Every time we gather here, we are strengthened again through the power of God's word. We are refreshed through his gift of forgiveness. We meet God Almighty every time we gather in worship. As we travel through this series, Building a Better St. Paul, we consider how God sees us, and we contemplate what we need to be doing here to live out God's vision for us. And today, we realize that part of being a family of God's loved and devoted children is engaging and trying to add to that family by sharing our faith. And to be clear, the goal of this sharing of faith is not that at the end we simply have more people sitting next to us in worship. That is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal of sharing our faith is that more people will come to know who Jesus is and that they'll be forever changed as a result. At the same time, we know that the absolute easiest way to demonstrate to somebody else what we believe is to simply invite them to join us, to have them come with us along on this ride. And so if we've never invited anyone to church, if we've never stepped up and shared our faith in a moment that God has presented before us, then the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Do I not love people enough to try something new? 
Do I not love them enough to simply invite them to church? Do I not care enough about people to risk at the worst what might be some mild embarrassment? What happens when our love for our neighbors is lacking? I have a story to share with you. This happened uh, thousands of years before Jesus walked the beach, rounding up fishers of men. God had his own uh, fish tale to tell. And it begins with a man by the name of Jonah. And God goes to Jonah, and he wants to send him with a message to a group of people who are nearby. Uh, This is a place called Nineveh. It's the capital uh, at that time of Assyria, right? And God wants Jonah to go to these people. Jonah has no love for them. In fact, he has uh, what we would call the opposite of love for them. Absolute disdain and hatred. It has been a lifetime of not getting along, of not caring for one another. But God tells Jonah to go and deliver his message to the people. And Jonah decides to go in a different direction. He actually uh, goes and he hops on a boat, hoping to set sail on his own adventure. As Jonah hangs out below deck, a storm breaks out. Such a storm that all the men up on the deck, they're fearing for their lives. And in that fear, they start calling out uh, to all their respective gods, hoping that they can calm this storm. Finally, uh, their screaming wakes Jonah. And when they get to Jonah, he confesses that he has done something to put himself at odds with God. And so the men say to Jonah, what can we do to fix this? Jonah's only suggestion is that they exit him from the ship immediately. And so reluctantly, the men pick Jonah up and they throw him overboard. And as soon as his body hits the water, the storm starts to die down. They are saved. Jonah has a problem. Jonah begins to sink. And as Jonah is sinking deeper and deeper, God sends a massive fish to swallow him up. He will stay in that fish for three days. And only then, God will then command the fish to spit him up on shore. Finally laying there in a pile of fish, I'll let you figure it out, God now finally has Jonah's attention. And more than his attention... God has Jonah's obedience. Tells Jonah again, go to the people of Nineveh. And Jonah goes. And he shares with them God's very direct message that their ways are not good ways, that their ways are ways that lead to their own destruction. And here's what happens. The people hear. They hear And they believe. And they are spared. And we are talking 120,000 people in this land. And what's Jonah's response? The Jonah who has been given this most amazing moment of mercy as God has saved him uh, from himself, as God has now used him to deliver this entire land of people, what is Jonah's response? He's frustrated. And he just wants to lay down and die. He has no love for these people. I'm not suggesting, not even for a moment, that we hate our neighbors the way that Jonah hated these people. But I am asking, do we love them? Do we really love them? Good. Good. Do we have a heart for the people that God places in our path? Good. (laughs) Oh, 
Wow, all of a sudden. All right. Do we see them as God's precious children, even when they're different than we are? When, when they uh, believe differently? When they behave differently? Now here's one, go with me. When they vote differently? Oh, oh, too soon, pastor, too soon. Right? What I'm asking us is this. Do we love our neighbors as Christ does? Remember, in Jesus, God loves a creation that does not love him back. Jesus taking on human form, coming into the middle of his creation, is the ultimate in humility and love. His love is met by skepticism, fear, frustration, and hatred. And it is hatred that places him on that cross. And yet three days later, when the stone is eventually rolled away from the tomb and Jesus is alive, there is a tidal wave of God's love that is unleashed intended to flow freely through all of God's people. It is in that love that the church is born. And this birth looks much more like an explosion than a birth. As all these people go out into the world doing exactly as their Savior has done, giving their very lives to reach one more person with the good news being met by a world that in large part hates them and yet choosing love. And here we are today as God's people in this place. And if we're being honest, we are not met with the same hostility that our brothers and sisters of many years ago were. We're mostly met with apathy. And the question we have to ask is, what does it look like to love these people too? And I'd suggest that it begins by struggling with our own apathy and by committing to praying for our neighbors. Commit to praying for our neighbors, asking God to bless them, and if you know them well, getting more specific about our prayers, praying for their children, praying for their marriages, praying for their work, praying most of all that God will use you to bless them. And if you don't know them well, dear God, I pray for the family in the blue house. It works too. But praying that God will use you, if they are far off from him today, he will use you for their benefit, to draw them a little bit closer. Pray for your neighbors, focus on being a good neighbor, and watch and see what God will do. I'll give you an example of this in action. So we have this group here called the trustees. Right? These are the people who are committed to caring for our facility and our grounds. We have a lot of both, but not a lot of trustees. This summer, in many different ways, and these people cared for our neighbors. You've likely noticed there's a lot of grass out there to mow. And very few people would blame us if we did the bare minimum to get by. And yet that's not what they did with their summer. Our trustees took on many outside projects for the benefit of our neighbors, beautifying the grounds that connect with their yards. And I'll tell you what, more than one neighbor noticed that and was appreciative. Recently, Tom Smith was mowing on the west side of our campus when he noticed that there was a neighbor who appeared to be in need. 
And he did this wild thing. He got off of his tractor. He got off of his tractor, not being able uh, to get to the neighbor, he got to the neighbor's neighbor. And he found out that, yes, indeed, there was a need there. And he arranged to have a day where we sent uh, some of our uh, trustees along with members of our youth group, and they gave up part of a Saturday to go and just care for her property. And our meal ministry folks, uh, they made meals like they do, and they left them at her doorstep. Right? All in the hopes that it would open up a door for her. Maybe a door for a relationship for us to have with our neighbor, or maybe just for her to know God has not forgotten her, and he loves her dearly. As our love for this community grows, we will build a better St. Paul. We will be a church that in love reaches out with open arms. And I want to caution us. We need to resist the temptation of becoming a Czech church. Right? Now, you can say, wait, what are you talking about? Right? <laughs> Pastor, you've been after us to be generous. And I still am. Right? Generosity is, is foundational to who we are. But we cannot be a church who, when met with the challenges of the community, simply writes checks. We need to be a church who, in love for our community, goes, gets to know our neighbors, reminds them how much we care because God cares for them. We need to love them enough to share the good news we need to love them enough sometimes to be that good news. And we have to do something next week that we didn't do this week. And it needs to be motivated not out of our own discomfort, but out of love. Because the love of Christ compels us. A love that each one of us has been given first. Amen. We continue now as we share a common confession of our faith as found in the Apostles' Creed. If you'll please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our time of offering, I'd like to just share with you quickly a brief video. This is about uh, a ministry called Climbing for Christ. You'll see a photo of that ministry on our mission wall. Uh, I want you to watch this and then we'll, we'll talk about it.
you can see from the images there that uh, uh, the locations are not Hilton and Greece and Spencerport, right? But these are uh, places far from here. But one of the amazing things about this story is it began here. Uh, the, the leaders of this ministry, uh, Gary and Elaine Fallison, were a school family here, school parents, um, members of a local church uh, that uh, felt this call from God uh, to go. Uh, this ministry, Climbing for Christ, is named that because that's exactly what they do. They're climbing uh, mountains, reaching places that are difficult, uh, if not impossible, for others to reach. And when they get there, they bring aid. When they get there, they bring the good news. Uh, it is a, it's an awesome ministry of going and sharing God's word. Uh, we have continued to support them the last several years, uh, primarily uh, through a connection with our Adela Society. Our Christmas cookie uh, fundraiser is one uh, that has been done uh, to support this ministry. Also, in exciting news, our Eastern District uh, Lutheran Women's Missionary League has just awarded this uh, ministry a $5,000 grant uh, to feed widows in Southern Africa. Um, this is just a great example of going to all the ends of the earth uh, to bring the good news. I did want to share with you, since we spent so many weeks working up to Harvest Home last week, and I just wanted uh, to quickly wrap that up for you. Uh, Tuesday uh, morning, uh, everything that had come in in terms of a food offering uh, went to uh, the local food shelf, and as we had uh, imagined from looking at it, it went way beyond what they could use for Thanksgiving. So that gift will help to refresh their shelves and provide food for those in need in this community for weeks to come. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we talked about the financial offering. This is something that I would love to see um, regain the enthusiasm and generosity that it had in, in decades past. To give you an idea, I think we're headed in the right direction. Two years ago, our uh, financial offering for Harvest Home was $818. Last year, we increased that gift by 1000 uh, going up to $1,800. Uh, this year, our Harvest Home offering was $4,407. So that's wonderful. Again, 50% um, of that will be a check that goes directly to the local food shelf. The other 50% will help uh, fuel the ongoing ministries uh, that we have here at St. Paul. We continue now with the prayers of the church. <clears throat> United with the saints of every time and place, let us pray for the church, for those in need, for all of God's creation. Faithful God, when we question the future, you reveal the hope of victory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us the wisdom to rely on your words and the courage to witness to your love and faithfulness. Give us, Father, a heart for our neighbors and a willingness to go. God, our joy. The seas and the hills, they shout your praise. Inspire us to sing a joyful song to you as we work to preserve and protect your marvelous creation. God, our ruler, you judge the world with righteousness and people with equity. Grant perseverance to world leaders and elected officials so that they may never grow weary in doing what is right. Lord, May we be a country that is known for doing what's right. May your people bring your peace in your perfect time. Gracious God, you offer peace to every fearful heart. Heal the hurts of all those who suffer, whether that suffering be injustice or persecution, sickness or isolation. We pray for those who are imprisoned, 
those who are hospitalized, all who have need. Today, Lord, we pray for Jackie and for Jean, for Kathy, and for Jim, for Rosa, for Jackie, for Kim, for Ann, for Betsy, and Bruce. We pray for Tom. Dear God, we pray for those in our families and in this community who have been touched by this virus. Lord, we pray that you will give them your strength. Dear Lord, we pray for those who are called to the front lines and those who are in health care and other fields uh, called, Lord, uh, to serve those who are hurting and those who are struggling. We ask for your hand of protection over them. Lord, we call out to you now with the names of those who are on our heart. God, you are our rescue. Everlasting God, as we await the dawn of the new heaven and new earth, we give thanks for your beloved who have died in Christ. Rejoicing in hope, we now lift our prayers to you, most gracious Lord, trusting that you receive them into your care. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Together we pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you.
Christ broken for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this gift. We ask that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. If you please stand up and mask up as we sing our final song.
One quick reminder, next Sunday following worship, uh, we'll be taking the next step in our visioning process as a church and school. If you're able to join us, we would love to have you. It'll be uh, a gathering down in the gymnasium uh, for a quick lunch, and then you'll be put to work as we'll work together uh, to think uh, creatively about uh, the challenges facing the church this day. Uh, we would love to have you. If you can join us, please make sure you call the church office or send an email so that we have you in our count for next Sunday. Now as we go, go with this blessing as it comes from the Lord. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give to your heart his peace. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. <laughs>